Hello, this is my summary video of The Mushroom at the End of the World and this is chapter 2 it's called Contamination as Collaboration I'm quite excited to make this summary because um, this is quite a short chapter and a um, quite interesting one he starts going, oh she sorry starts going into the um, ethnographic detail of this um, of the book so before she does this she continues on from the um, themes mentioned in the chapter before this um, and of the idea of contamination and how does a gathering become a happening that is a greater sum of its parts so um, she says that one answer uh, to this is contamination so what she means by this is all of these um, gatherings all of these groups merging they contaminate each other and they create something greater than all of these individual parts for instance maybe a new language I think that's uh, a good example um, so then she says um, <clears throat> then she starts talking about another concept the idea of um, survival and she uh, carries on talking about keeping precarity in mind um, in that it makes us remember that changing with circumstances is the stuff of survival so I um, so she then moves on to say that what is survival and uh, again making us look at um, our own concepts in that she says survival in American fantasies is often about saving oneself by fighting off others which is often uh, you know many shows or things we watch um, are in her view what she's said here are often a synonym for conquest and expansion so I do s sort of get what she's saying it's this idea of good triumphing over evil and expanding the good uh, empire maybe um, but she says I will not use this term that way so she's not going to use survival in that sort of way and then the next thing that I've um, actually underlined is please open yourself up to another usage. This book argues that staying alive for every species requires livable collaborations. So again, bringing in another concept. Uh, collaboration means working across difference which leads to contamination. Still keeping these continual concepts. But um, although I, I found this a little um, annoying at first, this idea of contamination it does actually um, when she starts to put it into an ethnographic context it gets quite interesting so she says without collaborations we all die now I think that actually makes sense without working together um, the world wouldn't function and we would die so um, she says popular fantasies are hardly the whole problem and um, one against all survival has also engaged scholars and um, <clears throat> so she's saying that it's not just a problem in fantasy novels and shows and things like that it's also an idea that troubles academia so um, the next idea she moves on to is thinking through self-containment and uh, the idea of individuals um, made it possible to ignore contamination so that is transformation through encounter so self-contained individuals are not transformed by encounter so I think it's this idea of um, she's linking back to the idea of uh, survival is about saving oneself and it's very individualistic notion we already have so she says um, 
she says the problem of precarious survival, again linking back to the concept mentioned in the other ch uh, chapter, the problem of precarious survival helps us see what is wrong. Precariality is the state of acknowledgement of our vulnerability to others. In order to survive we need help and help is always the service of another with or without intent. So she then gives uh, a few examples and says it's quite hard to uh, think of any challenge she might face without soliciting the assistance of others, human or not human. So if survival Hold on, just thinking of how to sum this up. Okay, so she then starts talking about, because we are all interdependent, we, rather than seeing only the expansion and conquest strategies of relentless individuals, so rather than just looking at individuals who are relentless, and um, and conquest and expand and progress we must look for histories that develop through contamination and thus a, a and thus how a gathering may become a happening so this will make more sense when we move on to the um, other concepts so she then moves on to discuss uh, detail about Oregon's forests and just the um, the sort of ecological links of how um, logging has affected the forests and I believe she sort of ties this in to some of the um, concepts that have been discussed um, yeah that's uh, there's, there is a bit more detail on that but that's the gist, the gist of what uh, the next page or so she discusses. Um, she then begins by discussing the eth more ethnographic detail and the cultures of the people that um, live there. So she starts out by saying, and what are the South Southeast Asian hill people doing in Oregon. Once I realised that almost everyone in the forest was there for expli explicitly ethnic reasons, finding out what these ethnicities implied became urgent. I needed to know what created, communi what created communal agendas that included mushroom hunting. So she said that despite their sp specificity, mine stand for all the pickers and the rest of us too. So I'm not too sure what mine is. Oh, that's it. It is a uh, the community uh, that is in this um, in this Oregon forest. It's the mine people, and um, she discusses the sort of history of these people and um, how. They have a distinctive script, and um, they're not, they are not known for respecting national boundaries, and communities have repeatedly crossed back and forth, especially when armies threaten. Um, and despite this mobility, they are actually hardly autonomous and free from the state in that um, they organised their communities around the opium trade and um, this sounds a bit strange that they organise their communities around the opium trade but that's how's that linked to the state well basically because they have these um, communities that formed around the opium trade it sounds it uh, they identify themselves as these um, ethnic communities so that in the so that the uh, Thai state um, Thai state came to identify 
them as an ethnic group with distinctive customs. So this shows that how they have a link to the state. Um, so this entire policy towards minorities made this identity possible. Um, meanwhile, along the Thailand border, they slip back and forth, evading the state policy on both sides, even while being shaped by it. So it sort of shaped their community, whilst also uh, they evaded it. So to understand how the mine came to be um, these mushroom pickers requires considering their relationship with another group now in the Oregon forest, the Humong. And the Humong are like the mine in many ways, as they also ran south from China, they also crossed borders and occupied the high altitudes suited, suited to commercial opium farming. Um, they also have distinct dialects and traditions. Um, so she then describes more about the different cultures and it's quite interesting, uh, discussing a bit of the history but all of this history does still um, have a relevant uh, relevance um, in the what she moves on to say, and this is uh, quite will be quite efficient to move on to this, is the is if a rush of troubled stories, if there's a lot of stories that come out of a place and it, if all these stories and all this history is a good way to understand contaminated diversity then it's time to make that rush part of our knowledge practices yeah so I think I think that's the point I think the point is that that these contaminated diversities can really only be understood by looking into how these things came about. So I think that hopefully I've done that a bit of justice. Just to ensure I've done this justice, I'm going to check back and I may add another bit onto this video. If not, then I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you for the next one.